Welcome back to Burst TV. To this morning, we never, I never do this, but it is eight o'clock in the morning, and today, fresh and early, I've got Katie Melko. Welcome to the show. Hey, how are you? Good, good, good. So, first off, I don't want to miss any of your um, your titles here. I'm just gonna, and you've got a lot of experience, but I'm gonna go through the main highlights. Okay. You're a fellow RDH. Yep. You've got a master's degree. Mm -hmm. You are a clinical instructor. You work in mobile dentistry. Yes. <laughs> and you're a self-published author of not only a children's book, but romance novels as well. Yes, yes. So I'm, I'm super excited to hear a little bit more about your story. And I'm, I'm one of those people that can talk to a wall. <laughs> and I go off in tangents. So we're going to try to stay focused here. Um, that's the challenge. All right. I'm like-minded like you, so good luck. <laughs> this, will be, this is going to be amazing guys. All right. So, but I, but there were like two, two themes that kind of stuck out I, I, for me. I saw you on a random post on Facebook. This is usually how it happens. Like I saw that you wrote a children's book and it was geared toward um, that first visit at the dentist. And I mean, that's universal. It's, it can be a scary thing, not only for kids, but for adults. Yeah. So what you've done will help the kiddos, but will help the adults. You've gone through some things in your life, some, as everybody has, some transitions where you had some fear, and then you got through that um, by being very strategic about it. And so I think the theme today is really just fears and goals. And part of this Burst community is um, one of our core values is like being super supportive to our colleagues and um, and being able to help each other. You know, we've got the book club, we've got the running club, and we've got stuff like this, so we can talk to our fellow colleagues and kind of get inspired, you know? So Absolutely. we'll stay on those themes, but tell me a little bit. So you were, you were a dental hygienist first of all of this, right? Yes, yeah, so I've been a hygienist for 10 years now. Um, I originally, I wanna say probably about two years into being a hygienist, I got extremely um, like weighed down by like always working in a four by four and feeling very like unuseful, I guess. I just didn't feel like I was making my impact on the world like I wanted to. And so I decided to start my own nonprofit and I had zero experience. I still had an associate's degree and I found myself very overwhelmed not by just starting a nonprofit and going through the IRS and all the paperwork, but trying to get momentum in the community to take me seriously as a 24 year old person trying to do this nonprofit. Most people spent their time basically laughing at me when I would sit down for a serious meeting, you know, asking for donations or planning events. Like no one would take me seriously. And I didn't at the time, really truly understand if it was because of my age or if it was because of my lack of college education. And then I decided that maybe if I started getting some grants under my belt that I would be able to be taken a little bit more seriously, but I didn't know how to do that. So that propelled me to go back to school. And I was like, once I get my master's degree, like this nonprofit is gonna be amazing. Like I'm gonna be able to do all this stuff. <laughs> like halfway through my non my uh, master's program, I closed my nonprofit and my whole entire career path changed. Like nothing that I wanted, not, not that the same base goal wasn't the same, but that particular nonprofit was no longer the direction that I wanted to spend all my efforts in. Right. In going back to school, I learned, I did learn so many things and it created me to fall in love with writing. Um, writing articles for dental uh, magazines, being more active in the community. I've always been a public health person. So as soon as I was able to get my foot in the door with some experience, I've been in public health ever since. I don't work in private practice anymore. But a lot of people feel like you do where, you know, something different. I even had that nagging feeling in the back of my head, which is like, this is great for now. But at some point, I just... You want I, and I think a lot of hygienists, yeah, they're just, you get kind of itchy. You're like, I need to do something different than this. And so that's inspiring. That, and that, that's, that's challenging when you get to a point where you're like, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. What I thought my, my goals before are not my goals now. Um, 
where, where do I go? So you, I looked at your YouTube video mm -hmm. and, um, you, you had a mentor of some sort in your life that they gave you a strategy for getting where you wanted to be. So can you share that with us? Yeah. So I say this to this woman all the time and she chuckles because she just doesn't see it that same way, but I'm literally only a hygienist because of this one woman. Like I struggled academically when I was in my associate's degree. I uh, never really wanted to go to college originally. And my parents were like, no, you're going like <laughs> you yourself, but you're you going have to do something. Yeah. Yeah. My dad was like, I don't care if you get in art and science, like whatever you want to do, you're going. And so I found myself into the hygiene path and I just didn't really want to be there. Didn't want to be at college at all. So I didn't put any of the fuel that I have in me that I know now into learning until it got taken away from me. And I realized that this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. So I want to say like right before my senior year, I actually, my GPA was, um, you had to have like a 2.76 to stay in a program mm -hmm. uh, cumulatively. And I had a 2.74. So they were like, you can't stay. And I was like, oh, like there's gotta be something I can do. Like I pass all my classes. It's just like point of a point. Like, right. Basically they gave me what they thought was probably like, she'll probably never be able to do this, but you know, like, we, at least we're getting her off my back is kind of how I look at it now but they basically like you need to get all straight A's your last semester of hygiene school you're not going to graduate and I hadn't basically never really gotten an A in any of my courses except for clinical the whole time I was in hygiene school and so I was like okay I'll do it <laughs> <laughs> Fine. And, <laughs> and I did it like I fell in love with hygiene and this was like I finally felt like I found my place and I loved it and this is what I was going to do so I ended up coming over that hurdle, but in the midst of all of that, I was, you know, extremely anxious. Um, I even probably had some depression about it because, like, what if I do all this and I fail? Um, mentally, I was um, three semesters behind everybody else because I really wasn't putting my all into what I needed to learn. And I had professors say to me, like, yeah, let her finish. She'll never graduate. She'll never pass her boards anyway, or she'll never graduate or whatever. And, like, a lot of people were not on my side. And this one person, like, sat me down one day and was like, you fought to be here. Like, I believe in you, and you can do this. And you just need to write down one thing that you want to accomplish. And this whole, like, whole semester, whole program, however you want to break it down, but write down one thing. And if you meet that goal, you were still successful. Even if your overall success wasn't what everybody else thought you would do, if you meet this one goal, you're still successful in your own mind. And so I did that. And I wrote down the goal that I just wanted to, of course, pass hygiene school, which was a pretty big goal. It's really not what she intended me to write down. But Right. That, that's like, <laughs> that's an overall, <laughs> that's a big hurdle. That wasn't right. one little element of this. So but, what I did was, is I wrote it down and then I said, okay, now how can, like, what little things can I do to make that big goal happen? So mini I went goals, yeah. and wrote like mini goals and things that I could do like either on a daily basis or whatever. And you know, I came out on the other end and like the day I went for my pinning and my oath, I still didn't know if I was graduating. And so I'm like, said to my parents, like, you don't have to come. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're like, this could go wrong. <laughs> <You're> really <bad. laughs> you know, what, don't you think they'd tell you not to show up? <laughs> like, no, let's not put like, her on the stage. Yeah. She was like, no, you're going to go to everything until we get all the numbers in. You know, they just didn't know, whatever. And so I went to my pinning and I went to my award ceremony and I said the same thing to my mom, like, just don't come. Like, <laughs> but my mom was like, I'm coming, you know, and I graduated with, you know, honors that semester and I got the like, Golden Scaler Award and another one and completely blew my mind. And I did graduate and, you know, I passed my boards and I became a hygienist and it was like one of the biggest accomplishments that I had ever done in my whole life. And it's really because of this one woman, because if I had listened to all the negativity that people were constantly spewing in my direction, yeah. I probably would have just crumbled and said, well, not meant for me and, and I can't do this. And it's really just one person. One person has to say, 
the smallest thing to you and it can mean the biggest thing to the person yes. hearing it and it can change their whole projection. I tell, I tell my kids all the time, I'm like, listen, and, and, I, and I tell colleagues this too, if, if they come across uh, a nasty patient, person that's not being nice to you or whatever, I'm sure they've got a lot going on. Every single person has the p- potential of making someone's day better, neutral, or worse. Mm-hmm. Choose wisely. Like, no matter what, just try to not make a person's day worse because you could be that straw in the camel's back that just sends them into a downward spiral. Or you could say that one thing that inspires them to be so much better and to have that confidence that they need. That's a, that's a fantastic story. So yes, I think anybody that out there that's, that's watching, you might not know exactly how everything is going to transpire, but write down that one goal. I've done it before. I, and, and you can have all these thought bubbles all the time and they really, sometimes they just don't transpire in anything, but there's so much um, strength and value in physically writing something down. It makes it more real. Yeah. Um, there was an amazing speaker at a conference I went to and his whole business was because I said I would. And so he literally would leave business cards laid around places for people to write things down. And then it would say, because I said I would. And it's accountability. Oh, awesome. Yeah, it's accountability. And he had an amazing story as to why. But this is another reason that I go to conferences at least once a year. Like you could go to a conference and feel wiped, like done with clinical, need a different chapter. I don't know if I can do this anymore. You know, you're mentally, physically strained. And I go to these conferences just for like the TED Talks. Yes. I walk out and, 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 and just the thing. energy. Mm-hmm. Just all these bright lights around you. You get so plugged in, dial, dialed in and, and re-energized. I, I find that too, especially now that I'm working from home. This has to happen and I've got to see people in person because right. I, I have like a little, um, I feel like I'm coming down off of 20 years of being physically in contact with people. And so I crave that. And right. you're right. It can, can take you out of a situation where you're burnt out just being around like-minded people. And it has to be the right people. You can't right. get together where you're where the girlfriend's on a weekly basis and have a glass of wine at a bitch session as, as much as that's valuable in itself, like that's not going to motivate you to do what you want to do. Yeah. And I, t- I explained this to my husband, like in the beginning, um, cause he was like, I don't understand why you want to do all these things all the time. Like, are you just there learning? Like it's not a vacation. And I'm like, I literally could probably get in my car right now and drive across the U S and be able to call somebody in almost every state saying, Hey, can I come stay? Yes. Right. Because of the networking and the vast majority of people that I have met are all like minded entrepreneurs or like go getters or just like these amazing people. And that's really the people that kind of attract to these conferences. They're looking to also meet like minded people, grow their connections, network, vent about dental or vent about business, like business. It's therapeutic to like get together with your girlfriend and talk about life and you know if you have kids or animals or whatever's going on but you could be like yeah work sucks but that person really doesn't get it or understand what work sucks means or want to hear you about dental if it's right and they're not going to be able to help you find a solution right to that you can talk about these universal problems that we all have and and i and i i never try to make dental hygiene like so exclusive that we have these unique problems that nobody else has but it, we all have the same types of issues. Um, but yeah, just, just getting together with our colleagues and um, it's inspiring. Yeah. And, and how amazing is the internet? I get to meet people like you. And I, I said the same thing not too long ago with all this first nation across the U.S. I was like, when I don't have to be at my home, I am going to travel across, across the U.S. and just couch surf on, right. on yeah. first um, couches. I think it's going to be amazing. And everybody's like, yeah, open invitation. Like, you know, we're <laughs> posts on my stuff on Facebook or anything. Like, my, my really close-knit friends or my husband, like, who are these people? I'm like, these, this is my tribe. This is my dental yeah, tribe. These, these are, are my people. people from all, <laughs> you know, the country and the world. It's, it's, it's something that I highly recommend to anybody. If you've never gone out of that state conference bubble, just do it once. Yeah, and just you'll be hooked. You'll be hooked. And people are always like, hey, if you want to meet up, like, love to meet new people. Like, they're so, op- like, everyone is usually so open to meeting new people. It's, yeah. it's not just, like, closed off, clicky, you know. No, no. It's so much, so much more positive than that. 
So tell me about this children's book. What inspired you to, you're, you're doing your clinical thing, you're doing your public health thing and um, focused on that. Where, where did the children's book come into play? So I fell in love with writing, like I said earlier in my master's, but I was like, I'll write, you know, articles for magazines. I never thought I would be here, but I worked in school systems for most of my 10 years and I would be the only person I would pack up, you know, equipment and, you know, work alone. And I would call, you know, students down from the list and I would see them in my rooms. And I'm talking anywhere from like three to almost in college. And I would have kids come down and like, as soon as they would like step into the room, you could see like, like the immediate, like, you know, their stomach drops and they just look like they don't want to be there. They're terrified. You know, some of them would even start crying hysterically. Yeah. Um, and I started, you know, thinking about it and I was like, why don't I try to make a book that I think parents can use to help their children, um, like be exposed to these elements before they're actually exposed to them in real life. So try to eliminate that fear of unknown and try to show them that, you know, this particular character went through these things and they ended up, you know, super happy at the end and, you know, but went through the same fears, same things that they're probably thinking um, and either don't know how to verbalize in a, like a healthy way um, or don't know what to do with their emotions. So it's like a two there's two big things that I try to get out of the story. Like, yes, I want to do like a show do tell so they can see it. Their parents can talk to them about it. And then when they get here, I can do it. And then I also want it to be like a healthy outlet for them to find a friend in Roxy in the book, but to understand that it's okay to be scared. It's okay to talk to your friends and your family. You just have to like get those emotions out in a healthy way. That's safe. So those are the two big key points that I try to hit with the book. And I think um, it's not just for kids. Like when I see this, there are a lot of adults that are dealing with stress over dentistry. I mean, it just, even let's say when we make a confirmation call and mom or dad says, oh, I have a dental appointment tomorrow. Instantly, your child who thinks you're very strong is like, oh no, my mom or my dad are afraid of going to the dentist. And it starts there. So I think if... The key for, in my mind, is to help these parents get ahead of that first visit. Um, yeah, you like know, how, and how just all of a sudden, oh, you've got to go in to the dentist and I'm taking you and this is big, scary, unknown thing. And how they can like, you know, put their own fears aside for their kids' sake, I would hope, but how they can actually help put a positive spin on that conversation too, you know? Um, I can't stand it when parents say like, you know, yeah, I keep telling them if they keep eating that, their teeth are going to rot out or they're, they're going to pull their teeth when they get here. Or I hope they have a ton of cavities and I'm like, oh. yeah, yeah. Well, if you have a cavity, they'll just take your tooth out. And I'm over here going, no, we, we, if you really had a problem, we would come in and save you and help you. That's what we're here for is to help people. <laughs> like let's switch that. This, this isn't like the boogie. Mon I, I compare it to the boogie monster in the closet. I don't want you to get out of bed. So I'm going to tell you a story about a boogie monster. Right. So that <laughs> that whole fear-based behavior. Uh, so most of their behavior is, is modified in a direction of fear or angst. And, you know, that's not a way to grow up. And that fear as a child will carry on to your adult life. Oh, of course. Yeah. So that's really what it does. And it has a companion plush. So like if kids want, they can bring those to their appointments to help them be brave is the whole point. And then Roxy, who's that character based on? So Roxy was my dog. Um, I had her for 12 years and I lost her um, about two and a half years ago. So when I originally wrote the book, it was about people. And then um, after she passed away, I decided to take the book back out and re-edit it and change it into it being animal based. And so she's the main character. Now tell me, um, why did you decide to, to self-publish this book? So it was very hard to get a traditional publisher. Um, I like a lot of people just self publish and they're fine with that. But I wanted to self publish and be a, somewhat of a success so that a traditional publisher might be more interested in, in my books because they've seen how much work I put into them. Mm -hmm. A lot of traditional publishers will want to see you do some type of Kickstarter program 
um, where you raise money to make the book and see that as successful because that shows them that nationally or worldwide there's interest in your design or your topic so they don't feel as threatened into or not threatened but like it's not as much of a risk for them not as much of a risk yeah now I, I have I have talked to an author before now she was she's doing something completely different um but she said that the average author needs to write probably six to seven books before they really start making a profit yeah so is that like, even true if you're self-publishing well i've been told by a couple of people like get your third and fourth book out there and things will really start turning around and i'm like yeah where do you come up with the finances to feed all these books when you're you know you the first book and the second book i did com not completely different but um i took a different path just financially um, but the first book, I had it printed in China and printed in mass bulk quantities, mm -hmm. which is the dental book. But I still have, you know, like 500 books sitting in my spare room that I'm, you know, selling and trying to get rid of. So if you're going to keep self-publishing, that was money that I probably didn't have to spend and I could have just printed on demand. Yeah. But these are all learning things. So the second book, I created the same exact way but then i put it in a print on demand so i'll print like okay. 30 copies. So it's almost like a drop ship yeah and i'll print like 30 copies at a time and keep them at my house to take them to events or you know ship them out if people buy them awesome but i also have the books now on amazon like they're sold on amazon and barnes and noble so if they want them they can also go to the print on demand and order the book to come right to their store so it eliminates some of that shipping stuff that I have to do too. yeah yeah <clears throat> but the quality so what good. what she's saying is that um go to her website and get one so that she can get it out of her house yeah. <laughs> um, we're not supposed to be all salesy here but I just bought two last night because I have I have a huge collection of kids books oh that's all awesome. kids books um and I just realized last night that when my kids had a when we had a garage sale I probably 10 of them ended up in that garage sale and I didn't realize. I just, I, I love you. This is the first time we've ever, um, we've ever met each other. Um, you're just so driven and so motivated. And the thing that I like about you is that, and this, this is a message that I want to give to you. It's that we're all going to have fears. Mm -hmm. We can talk through them. It's normal to, if you're ever feeling burnout, pick up the phone, talk to somebody. That's what this community is about. And, um, and write those goals down. I wrote down three big, hairy, audacious goals two years ago, met every one of them. And it was because I physically wrote it down and then I tore them off of paper as they happened. And I mean, they were like, I did not imagine they were going to happen. I wrote down a list of goals that I wanted to do back in 2016 um, when I was in a very driven leadership um, path. I look at those goals today and I guess I did accomplish some of them, but I wrote down like 10 or 15 of them. It's okay if your goals change. Right. Like I look at some of those goals and I'm like, it's not really where I want to go now because of all these other things I've done. So that's okay. Like don't feel like a failure just because you wrote something down, you no longer want to do it or you didn't accomplish it. Right. Right. Every, yeah. Every day is a whole new adventure. Like, yeah, sometimes you get there. I feel like Forrest Gump. Sometimes you're running, 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 and then you stop and you're like, I'm going to go this direction. And it's not, it's not a failure. There's nothing wrong with that. You're just like, I don't want to do that anymore. So I'm going to go over here for a little while and try that. Yeah. And the other advice I give, um, I like to give is that you can ask other people who are on like minded paths that you are, you know, how they got there and all these things. I would use those tools as inspiration and motivation and determination to get there, but please don't try to copy their path. Right. Make your own because you'll, be very disappointed if you can't become that same thing. And you want to be your own, you want to have your own unique identity. So you'll use those conversations as guidelines. Right, right. Just as inspiration. But that, yeah, that's, that's true. I know a lot of people are mentally in that, in that um, space where they see other people. And that's the, that's the bad part about social media. You have yeah. to use it to your advantage, um, but it can lead to a lot of depression for people because they're like, I see what other people are doing and I want to do something like that. So let me, let me just do that. Let me copy that because maybe I'll be happy when I get there. And that's, everybody's on their own path. You're going to shoot yourself in the foot by, by chasing somebody else's dreams. Yes. And if and you, you feel like giving up, don't do it because you're probably almost there. 
<laughs> exactly. Right when it really starts to get ugly, right, right. when you're like almost crying there. in the shower, you're almost there. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for coming on today. Um, let's do this again. Yes, absolutely. Have, all right, Katie, have a great day in the trenches. <laughs> you stay in touch <laughs> and we'll see you okay. soon. I'll put all your contact information in the comments below. If you guys have any questions for her, leave them in the comments, make sure to like, and subscribe and we'll see you soon.